Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Fulbright Speaker Series. I am Angeles Paquerizo, a Fulbright alumni from Spain, living in California, and a board member of the San Diego chapter of the Fulbright Association. I'm a transplant surgeon at Scripps Green Hospital and the CEO and founder of MedApps AB. And I'm going to be your host today. Before we start, I want to share with you a few housekeeping issues. The webinar will be recorded and available in a few days. And you are muted, but you can use the Q&A feature to ask questions that we will answer at the end of the presentation. One year has passed since the World Health Organization declared COVID-19 a pandemic. The pandemic has reshaped our world and transformed and accelerated innovation in the way we work, and probably forever. We know that work will never be the same. Our Fulbright Speaker Series brings a great opportunity to learn from Professor Wete, who will be discussing how organizations can adapt to the current circumstances and successfully transform the workplace. Professor Wete holds a degree in law, an MBA, and a PhD in business administration. He's a professor of, at IES, I, I, sorry, IESE Business School since 1982, speaker for top management teams in over 800 companies in 70 countries, lecturer at Harvard Business School, co-founder of Instituto Gobernanza y Sociedad, vice-chancellor and treasurer of the International Academy of Management, board member of numerous companies, author of 12 milestone management books, and a Fulbright scholar and board member of the Fulbright chapter in Spain. That is why we are so grateful to have him join us today for our Fulbright Speaker Series, presenting Transforming the Workplace and Empowering the Team. Without further ado, let me introduce you to Professor Wete. Luis, we are delighted to have you with us today. Thanks for joining us, and the virtual stage is all yours. Very good. <clears throat> so, Angeles, thank you so much for the introduction. You forgot to say that I'm a good friend of you, uh, that uh, we've been in many of those Fulbright uh, trips uh, in the past. And uh, now I'm very happy to be sort of in, uh, in the presentation. So let me see what is, there is some noise here. Let's see what is going on. Uh, probably, okay. Wait, okay, so now, now there is no noise. There was a newspaper with uh, sort of uh, some uh, speaker uh, talking about politics, I guess. Eh? So listen, we only have one hour. So my idea is uh, to share with you seven tools with a short introduction and also with some final remarks. And of course, uh, with uh, time so that we can um, have question and answer at the end. Also, if you want to sort of uh, during the presentation just uh, make uh, some remarks or just ask some questions, feel absolutely free. This is a time for you and for me. This is not just me talking. This is us thinking together on an issue that uh, is relevant to your life. It's relevant to my life. That is hey, how we lead teams and how we organize the, the, the workplace in a way that uh, fits both the interests of the people around and also uh, is uh, help us to create a sort of the environment in which we can do uh, great work. I do have a presentation with something like 36 or 37 slides, many of them with uh, two by two metrics. You know, I tend to use a lot of those two by two metrics. And uh, the presentation is going to be also available for you in case uh, you want to have it. Eh? So that, um, well, eventually, if you want to make some notes or whatever, uh, more than happy that you do that. So let's see, I'm going to share my presentation uh, and uh, let's see, let's go to, let's go to the beginning and uh, you let me know if everything is okay. So <clears throat> Angeles, can you, saw, no, not this one. Can you see it? Okay. 
So basically, the title is the one that I said to you. As Angel said, I happen to be a faculty in a business school based uh, basically in Barcelona, but also with campuses on many other uh, places in New York, Munich, and Sao Paulo. And uh, let's just jump into the presentation. <clears throat> you know that one of the things that a team should do always before we have a meeting is uh, spending just one minute in the freezing. Eh? And uh, the way I'm going to be the prison so that we get to know, or at least you get to know myself a little bit better, is talking about the US mentors that uh, I had when I was doing my PhD program. And by the way, I got the Fulbright Fellowship in 1984, so almost 40 years ago. Yeah, that was a great time. Yeah. So Al Alida Roth is, uh, was my chairperson. Uh, she was amazing. Yeah. Uh, hard worker, very smart. She won the prize of the best dissertation of the year, something like five years before uh, I met her uh, in, at, by the, the Decision Science Institute. She worked, she asked me to, she forced me to work so hard that I ended up also winning the same award. And that was fabulous. Um, so not very many days, but uh, Alida was such a hard worker that uh, uh, some days I found the day after that she had slept uh, uh, in, in her office. Eh? She, in that sense, uh, she was a, a great example of hard work, but probably too much. Then I also uh, had the pleasure of um, meeting uh, Professor Hesket from Harvard Business School and also Professor Elsasser, who used to be the vice dean of Harvard Business School. And I learned also a lot from them. Uh, how to teach, uh, how to sort of all the material on customer centricity that I've been using many years. I've been also teaching with them, along with them, seminars all over the world. So for me, they were also great mentors. Then I also met California, you probably, many of you know him, uh, Tony Robbins. I uh, ended up going to many of his seminars and he was very enlightened eh, for me. And uh, it was a great combination, the Harvard stuff with uh, what I learned from Tony Robbins. And but then last but not least, there is also another Californian, uh, Professor uh, Isaac Adithes, who, used, who happened to be living in, uh, in, in, not in San Diego, Santa Barbara. And uh, he's the person with the wiser view on organization, on how to create healthy uh, companies and uh, how to uh, make companies more adaptive. So for me, it has been also a great source of, uh, of enlightenment. So this is my praise. So those are the people that have been, so to speak, uh, learning the most. Uh, I met them uh, while, while I was doing my PhDs, and I've been uh, sort of uh, been in contact with them since then. So let's jump into the material, short introduction, and a short introduction with the following concept. <clears throat> Your team, the team that you happen to be part of, the team that you happen to be leading, uh, is an ecosystem. Eh? And you know by, you know, the theory, a system works well when there is quality in the elements that are happy to be part of that ecosystem, but also when the quality of the relationship is high. So it's not a question of having good parts, it's a question of developing good relationship. So here comes also a very interesting, so to speak, consequence of this. <clears throat> Since this is an ecosystem with many elements, a change in one element affects the rest. <clears throat> and in that sense, uh, any changes in any of the different elements of that system is a call for reintegration. Uh, why? Because it has to fit with the rest of the, of the element. This is interesting because uh, for us means among many other things that, uh, hey, diversity is the name of the game. We, it's, it's a fact, but it's also something that is we need it. Eh? But at the same time, we need this oneness in which uh, things are fit together well. If not, that ecosystem is not going to work well. Again, that's uh, an idea. It's, it's, I know it's a simple one, but you, you know it's going to have, it, it has a lot, a lot of consequences that we will be touching on in a minute. This is Professor Adithes, the one that I mentioned to you before. And this is a great sort of insight that he has. He, he uses this uh, formula saying that the long-term success of any system, of any organization, of any team, of any family, is uh, based on how much uh, external integration we build, 
and external integration is delivering services that uh, the market, so to speak, uh, values them, divided by uh, less internal disintegration. Meaning by less internal disintegration, more alignment, more motivation, more collaboration, and, and the like. So here also is, uh, I think it's a great, so to speak, insight. Is uh, part of you, 50% of our job is how to make more relevant what we do for the outside world. 50% of our time or 50% of our work is how to create more cohesion yeah, so that uh, there is no waste of energy in internal disintegration so that uh, we can focus on building that uh, uh, products and services that uh, customers of the market <coughs> will, will appreciate or will love. So that was the introduction, seven tools. Uh, so let's go one by one. Uh, tool one and two is going to take us a little bit more time, <clears throat> but you will see that uh, the rest of the tools are going to be a little bit more sort of, uh, uh, it's going to, <clears throat> we, we, we will need less time to, to go through them. So tool number one is say, uh, hey, there is a couple of ideas that I want to discuss with you eh, that has to do with uh, transforming the workplace. Eh? And uh, you will see that there is uh, an opportunity, but also as always there is a risk that uh, the workplace can, can go not in the direction that we want. So let's see those two ideas. The first one is the following. <clears throat> two, two variables. One is um, the perspective from the job content and uh, from the type of activity that uh, you or your uh, colleagues end up performing. Some of them um, can be done remotely and some other uh, activities need to be done on the premises. Okay, so that's one of the two variables. Then the second variable is your preference or the preference of the people that you happen to have around. Would you like to work from home? And there might be people that says no. Why? Well, because I don't have enough space. I don't have silence. Um, I may not have the tools that I need. Uh, I, I may feel a little bit alone if I happen to be at home every day, or uh, hey, I may have a little bit of fear of losing my job because of not being in, in where the action is. Eh? So there, is, there are reasons why people may not like to work from home, but also there might be reasons why some of, some of us or some other people from our team do prefer to work from home. Why? Because safe transfer time. Why? Because it's cost savings in terms of lunches and the like. Well, because I've got a beautiful home and I'm very comfortable here, or because uh, it uh, allows me, like I happen to be working from my beach home in the south of Spain instead of uh, Madrid. And I still can deliver, so, so to speak, work for uh, my clients. Or, hey, I happen to be with my family and uh, working at home is, is uh, help me to combine better my personal and my professional, so to speak, uh, elements. Okay? So those are uh, the two other uh, situations. And then we combine and then there is a very clear case for back to office. I guess that one third of the situation is going to follow into this quadrant. There might be a very clear case for remote work and easily also another 30-40% of the people might be there. And then the rest is going to follow into one of those two uh, other quadrants in which uh, there has to be flexibility. Yeah, there has to be hey, a low return, but uh, use more occupational values or switch uh, the job content so that uh, you end up having uh, job content that uh, need to be done on the premises, this type of things, or limit the days in office or flexible hours or uh, blend online and offline. So at the end, my message is, um, by the way, my, before my message is more employee, uh, make employees circumstances uh, a key driver of this hybrid model eh, that uh, we, we will need to build eh, in which there are going to be people working from the office almost every day, people not coming to the office almost, almost not, not days, and then some of the people coming in and out. By the way, this hybrid model is, uh, will also re request more uh, upsides eh, in which uh, we see each other uh, on, on sort of a, in, in, in a setting that allows uh, to create a little bit more rapport and to create more empathy and uh, also to build, so to speak, 
uh, this uh, sense of community in, 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 in the team. I just uh, included, um, that was yesterday's newspaper in Spain, saying that uh, some big organizations are great calling people back uh, to, to their offices, eh, with uh, probably with the reason that, hey, teamwork is so important that, that we need to have people close together because proximity is power, as, as, as you know, and uh, we, we want to have people around. Eh? So, We'll see. Uh, I think there is a wonderful opportunity to have those hybrid models, but also you will see that there are, so to speak, forces in which uh, they might go against that hybrid model and, uh, and call more for a just traditional model. So that was one idea. Then the second idea is the following. The labor market is going to become more polarized, eh? and uh, that's not not necessarily good news. And let me explain. Uh, we use this by two two by two metrics, in which we say, okay, your job is it is it repetitive? So do you do most of the day the same things that you done the previous day? Yes and no. And then, uh, what is the main engine of uh, your uh, job? Is it your hands? or is it more your head? Eh? And, uh, this is a traditional two by two metrics that uh, you probably have uh, already seen. And basically uh, what we see is the following. Hey, jobs that were done, that were very repetitive and were done mainly by the hands, the industrial revolution uh, smashed them eh? for the better. <laughs> so they, they took a big hit on those type of jobs. And here comes the interesting thing. The same is happening right now with the digital revolution. So jobs that were done with the head, but were mostly repetitive, are going to disappear, uh, most of them. Good news or bad news? Well, the bad news is that those were the jobs that are uh, in which the middle class were based. So the problem may arise in which we are going to have two type of mostly jobs that are low wages typical like a waitress that is non-repetitive, but is done mostly with the, with the, just working or with, with the hands. And then we are going to have what is called the uh, jobs that are not repetitive, done with the head, in which there is going to be very high wages and in which there is going to apply what we call the superstar economics. economics. Meaning by this, that the best take it all, eh? so that uh, they are the best in each field can make an immense amount of money. Why? Because uh, the product is global. Why? Because they have the visibility. Why? It happens like uh, in sports and uh, or in music and the like. So the most famous one makes much, much, much more money than, uh, so than the rest. So my Concern is the following, a labor market polarization is, is maybe a receipt for social unrest. Okay? And uh, we don't want that because we don't want the, so the society to be polarized. And uh, so we better do something because uh, maybe this is a risk that uh, we are going to confront in the future. So let's uh, jump to tool number two. And basically is <clears throat> technological change um, the uh, changes in the lifestyle of people, uh, changes in regulations, blah, 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 is going to bring to our teams many more, compl many more complex problems. And the question that I ask myself and the question that I suggest you to ask is, hey, are we ready to cope with more complex problems? Eh? Because you will see that uh, you need a very functional team to deal with very complex problems that happen to be the ones that are going to become more normal. Change, is it good or bad? Well, as always, it can be a pain on the neck because you have to make a lot of decisions and you have to implement a lot of new things, but at the same time, change is what allows us <laughs> that, uh, as, as the chairman of the president of Porch says, that uh, is, change is, the, the, is help us uh, that, so that the mediocre uh, eventually will not catch up with us. Eh? 
So that's the beauty of change that, I mean, people that work well is uh, help, knows how to deal with that change can still, so to speak, uh, be on the forefront. So this is uh, the way that also Professor Radices looks at uh, change. Uh, change is going to bring us tremendous opportunities, but also a few problems. Uh, both problems and opportunities is a call for uh, you have to do something and uh, basically manage change is equal to taking decisions more often and also uh, doing more implementation of those decisions. Now, decision is equal to uncertainty. So there is an issue that is going to be uh, more important that is how to deal with uncertainty. And then uh, implementation is also, uh, we, we will have to cope with risk. Eh? On, 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 uh, is it going to work or not and the like. So, see how teams can work here uh, because <clears throat> to deal with uncertainty hey if we happen to have a complementary team in which people can see at uh, the same issue with uh, different views and uh, they know how to respect each other bingo they can make a better decision okay? but again uh, you need diversity and you need also a diversity that uh, knows how to work together well with respect. And we will touch on this a little bit later. And then uh, for implementation, we also need teams. Why? Because there is uh, going to be different interests and we have to sort of uh, bring those interests a little bit more uh, online. Eh? And uh, for that, <clears throat> we need to create more trust around ourselves. And so we need teams to make good decisions, teams to implement things. We need teams with respect right? and teams with uh, this mutual trust if we want to implement things well because we have to bring together different, in one hand, styles and in the second hand, different, so to speak, interests. Now, both making decision and implementation is going to bring conflicts uh, and conflicts tend to be destructive, but here comes a little bit of uh, the message. If we end up developing enough mutual trust and respect around, <clears throat> conflicts can become constructive. And constructive uh, means uh, integration. And constructive uh, means that uh, that diversity end up creating a complementary team that uh, knows how to uh, blend those different views and knows how to, so to speak, blend those different interests in, in smart ways. Eh? And uh, that creates a learning process and that creates a very, so to speak, progressive uh, dynamics. A little bit more on this. Uh, we were talking about conflicts and this is also the way we look at conflicts and other two variables. Do we have in that particular team uh, psychological safety to express my views? Do I have space in which people will listen to what I want to say? And then the other variable is, hey, how, how, how do I feel with, uh, the, with my colleagues? Okay? And it might be a relatively bad feeling or a better feeling. Now, you combine those two things and then you get four conflicts. Uh, one conflict that happened to be the most dangerous one, that is, uh, I dislike you. And at the same time, I, I don't feel comfortable expressing my views in front of, of you or in front of the rest. And these end up creating something that is called cynicism. You know, so good for team dynamics. Then there is another uh, situation that is apparently, the feeling is okay, apparently we like each other, apparently we happen to be sort of a cohesive team, but there are many issues in which uh, there is, for whatever reasons, we are not supposed to talk. Eh? Well, I'm not supposed to bring, and this creates what is expressed in, it, in Italian, omerta, who is the law of silence. And uh, again, that's a conflict. Eh? We've seen that in the mafia movies. One day they kiss each other, then the following day they, they, they kill each other. Eh? So that dynamic of uh, apparently we like to be part of this group, but there are too many things or important things that we we cannot talk about that end up also um, creating a conflict that is dysfunctional. So what else? Uh, we have another dysfunctional conflict that is confrontation. That is, uh, hey, there is no empathy with you, but at the same time, I feel very, very free to, to express my views. And this end up creating confrontation. Eh? 
my view is confrontation probably in most of the cases is the less uh, is the less dysfunctional of those three conflicts that we already have mentioned because at least the things uh, you know what is going on you know uh, what a, what is the issue and then last but not least there is a wonderful conflict that is the one that is based on mutual respect and is based on uh, mutual uh, uh, trust that is uh, based also on mutual good feelings and at the same time space in which we can express and we listen to each other and this we call it healthy discrepancy we call it also a real conversation and those are the type of conflicts that will create a great learning environment for our team and this is the one that uh, we we should be fostering eh, if we want to create uh, more effectiveness in, in our team so please keep creating better space for sharing ideas for discussing ideas and please uh, keep sort of promoting a sense of belonging so that there is empathy so that there is this uh, feeling that uh, we are part of something we are part of this thing and we are doing great work because that also will help to create this uh, change is going to bring hey, more integration because of this. Uh, a quotation like many others, what destroys a team and any other relationship is not what we fight about, but how we fight yeah, and how we handle those differences. We know it and this is the beauty, it's learning how to do it, how to, how to talk about important issues or conflicting issues or uh, sensitive issues in ways that doesn't destroy the relationship. This is the secret. This is something that is, is part of our job. It's something that we have to learn. So we were talking about respect, some tips. We will also provide some tips on trust, eh, who happen to be those elements that end up creating a healthy complex. Uh, mutual respect. <clears throat> based on willingness to listen to different point of view. And again, easy to say, for some people, this is tough. Eh? Uh, mutual respect is having an intellectual acceptance that your views, your view is legitimate, but they are all the views that are also legitimate. Eh? And in that sense is, hey, having that curiosity of, of uh, how, how this other person look, uh, sees the, the same thing that I'm looking at. That, that, that intellectual accept, acceptance is, is part of uh, building this capability to, 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 to show and to create mutual respect around yourself. Then also mutual respect has to be um, operationalized in creating a short-term agenda, meaning, hey, what the team has, the priority of the teams that integrates uh, most of the team expectation. Why? So that also they, well, so that they also feel good being part of the team, so that they feel respected because their expectation, so to speak, we, we take, uh, we are sensible to them. And then last tip is, hey, if uh, we end up building some long-term priorities of what this team has to do that resound to most of the team members, then my experience is that the day-to-day -day conflicts end up not being so important because we see those day-by-day -day sort of a conflict, some of them a little bit dysfunctional. We see it in the context of a great, so to speak, uh, long-term objective or a, or a great, um, I don't know, uh, willingness to do great things. And then you put it into the context and then those small things end up becoming even smaller. So those are some tips to increase mutual respect. Let me just uh, some other tips to increase that trust. And basically here is uh, identifying that trust is based on four elements. Those are three of them. Credibility, uh, how reliable happen to be the people around, and how em 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 empathic happen to be the people, divided by how self Centric, they happen to be. So if you want to have a, if you want to develop trust around yourself, hey, work on your credibility, 
work on your reliability, work on your empathy, and also try to control a little bit, a little bit more your ego. Eh? That is going to create trust, and then trust is going to create collaboration, and collaboration is going to create, so to speak, a very progressive way in which we end up working together. Hmm? So that was tool number two. Uh, we still have five more to go, and uh, we happy to have something like 20, 25 more minutes. So, tool number three, and again, see yourself as uh, the impact that you can have on your team, eh, so that uh, you as a lead in that team, uh, how you can create the, the context in which uh, the effectiveness is, 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 is bigger, and, the, and that sense of also of uh, perceived value on, on being part of the team also increases. And uh, you will see that tool number three is a little bit a consequence of what we already had said. If you manage well a team, that diversity that comes because it's a fact uh, will end up uh, creating a decent integration and also will end up creating something that is even more valuable because there is complementarity. And complementarity is, is a learning mechanism. And this is the way, we, this is one of the models that we use is we need to look at things from at least four different point of view. Okay? Uh, and there are people that tend to look at things according to these different colors um, because they've been growing that way okay? or because for whatever reasons they are much more uh, better in, in, in using one of those views than in the rest. And basically what we claim is the following is that there are people that tend to be more strategic uh, we call it the red, so to speak, personality and the yellow personality. The, the, the red personality, as we will see in a minute, are also, they end up having a strong determination to execute. And there are people that are this way. They are much more into the short-term performing. Okay? And uh, so an issue can be seen from the short-term strategic point of view. An issue can be also seen from the short-term, but also more from the execution point of view. Uh, and again, there are personalities, the blue ones so that we call that happen to be very good at that because they are very rigorous to administrate the day to day. And in that sense, they can sort of uh, that, that view on the short term efficiency, they bring it to the table. Then there is there are people that happen to have more this human touch. Uh, so they know how to make people feel good together, how to, to make a team work well, that they do this. You know, Green people that uh, happen to have this in integrator's capability. And then last but not least, there is another view that is the long-term view and the more strategic long-term view that happen to be uh, better developing people that are more entrepreneurial, that are very creative to innovate and the like. Okay? So these are the four views that uh, we need to integrate in if we want to make good decisions. And the interesting thing is that there are people that uh, end up being, because of his or her personality, very good in each of the colors. And uh, part of leading a team is making sure that those four different points of view happen to be present in when, when taking decisions. This is a little bit the same, but with uh, the interesting thing that the, the red side is more the what, who is one of the key imperatives. The blue is more the how. The green is more the who, and the yellow is more the why. And you see also that the when tend to be a mixture of uh, the red and the yellow. So look at this because uh, that's complementarity. That uh, can be done also by diverse people because there are people that are more into the how, there are people that are more into the who, there are people that are more acumen in the why, and there are people that are very much into, they are more pushing into the what. Okay? So making that, those four views uh, balanced and uh, integrated in, into the team decision making is, 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 is a must. It's something that we have to uh, know how to do it well. Mm -hmm. Imagine that you happen to be the CEO of a company. You, you will have to have also typically people that are more short and efficient, people that are more uh, short term effective, or people that are more long, long, long run efficient or long run effective. And typically those are the areas in which 
they tend to be uh, more into chart into these of those in, in, into each of those uh, so to speak colors. Okay? Making it together uh, will help us to do well the performing with the short term and the transforming, who happen to be more the long, long, long run. And again, both from the effective point of view and from the efficient point of view. That's uh, that's the dream. Okay? That's uh, also uh, the long-term objective of uh, running well at it. So this is a little bit the type of order. I start with the why, typically, then move to the what okay? when discussing, then probably move to the who should do it, then the when, because the who is going to condition the when, and then last, not because it's less important, but because it has to be the consequence of everything else, is the how. Just talking about colors, please use it also for uh, your time allocation as a team leader. Uh, priority number one, green, time for integration. So for you, the most important thing that you have to do is spending time so that that team works well. It is integration with that team. Second priority, time yellow, time to question the status quo. The, to question the way we do things uh, with, the, with the aim of uh, trying to improve the way we do it. Third priority, blue, so that uh, you do planning, so that you do follow up, so that you do inspection. But this is not the one number one priority, this is probably number three. And then last, yeah, and uh, this is an important message, is red time. Red time is time that you use to personally get things done. The more that you happen to be in charge of a team, the more that uh, your job is making others, or helping others to do well their job. And this is done through green, through yellow, and through blue. And not your, your, the, the higher you happen to be, the less you, you will have to do things by yourself. Okay? And uh, make sure that this uh, message is, uh, you, you remember it. So, two number four. Uh, two number four is the following. Mm, the effectiveness of a team mm, takes time. Yeah? And uh, what, um, what, what uh, my, my call for you is, hey, spend more time getting to know each other. Uh, not only on the professional level, but also on, on a human level and also spend time to agree on the way you want to work together. Okay? And basically, the way you can do it is create a dynamics in which you end up asking people hey, what is needed so that uh, you sense that in this team, there is trust and respect to your uh, work and, uh, the, uh, and uh, that others are happen to be worth of that uh, respect and trust. And then come up with some ideas. Okay? that are uh, not ideas that come from the theory, but come from the experience of, of the participants of that particular team. This is a little bit the way we look at it. It's the time you spend knowing, to each, knowing each other and time that you spend on norming. Norming is, hey, let's agree on the way we want to work together, a low high, and then how effective a team end up becoming. And the correlation is more or less the following. So if you spend something like seven out of 10 in terms of time, the effectiveness is just going to be two. Okay? So only when uh, you spend nine or 10 in uh, getting to know each other and uh, putting together some ideas on how we want to work together is when the effectiveness of that particular team poof, end, up, end up exploding. Okay? So please also that's a, an interesting uh, idea that I've seen, uh, although that I've learned in, in, in my professional life. More on this, here the message is that a team performs better when they self-impose themselves some rules. Okay? But also here comes an important message. Hey, if there is no sanctions, or what I mean by sanctions is no negative reinforcement, equals to no rules. Okay? So also make sure that part of the equation is, hey, how are we going to create 
a little bit this negative incentive to the people that don't follow the rules that we had agreed upon that is the way we want to work together. Typically what I've seen, and uh, this also comes from a program that I attend with Professor Adithes, is uh, people end up coming with those hard words like punctuality, like only speaking one at a time, like uh, no side talks, like no emails or calls of when we work together, that uh, no in and out of the room, uh, that let's sit in circles if we can so that we see each other. Uh, don't put coffee or uh, snacks in the room because then people get a little bit focused. Eh? Hey, let's break every hey minute so that we can do things eh, like emailing or uh, just going to the bathroom. Uh, hey, the next to talk is the one that is at the right of the last people talking and the one that has his or her hand raised eh? so that there is a little bit of order in who is going to be talking the next. And uh, we address each other uh, by name so that there is more connection. Eh? Those are the type of norms that uh, end up people selecting to apply to themselves. And basically those are the results of what, what would makes you feel respected and, 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 and trust. Eh? And people end up sort of uh, coming with uh, those sort of ideas. Typically, we do hard rules uh, examples, uh, hard rules and uh, soft rules. And soft rules, here are some examples. Uh, hey, listen and talk with uh, empathy, but also with, uh, with uh, clarity. Uh, let's um, create a little bit of equal right to voice the view so that there is not one that is a little bit more yellow or more, uh, or more uh, red that tend to talk more than the other ones, so that everyone has the same uh, opportunity to talk, confidentiality of what we talk, not talks behind a third person if he or she is not present, and uh, hey, if we know each other and if we know the topic of each other, that's going to foster a reciprocity and that's going to be good for the team. Also, uh, what we strongly recommend so that the dynamic of the team gets better is uh, there has to be a conductor, as always, but there has to be an observer, someone that will give us feedback at the end of the session on how well we did that. And also there has to be a norm keeper, the one that is going to be, so to speak, uh, making sure that everyone, uh, everyone comply with uh, those rules. And then in case that we need some negative or some uh, reinforcement, some sanctions, typically what I've seen teams deciding is let's do some push-up if uh, someone comes late, for, for instance, or let's uh, put $10 so that we can use it for uh, charity or for just yes, going for a dinner, or let's uh, yes, have also a small sanction that is in the next 10 minutes, you cannot talk, these sort of things. Okay? Hey, this build, this is, I know this is a little bit on, hey, uh, bringing rigorness into the way we do things, but this end up creating integration. That's uh, our experience. A little bit the same, uh, with better internal coordination among the team members and with better, so to speak, relationship, there is going to be more collaboration. And more collaboration is wonderful because help us to create, to take better decision, help us to better execution, and also help us to create a better atmosphere. Okay, so remember that collaboration is based on good internal coordination mechanism, but it's also is on the hard side and the soft side is a little bit more of those trust and respect that we've been talking about. So just jump to tool number five. <clears throat> and tool number five uh, says the following. There is one thing that is taking a decision and there is something that is much more interesting that is making a decision. Okay? And this is the way we <clears throat> want to show it. Typically making a decision is going through the all the eight steps and taking a decision is just jumping to uh, step number seven. Okay? And typically uh, making a decision is much more richer. Why? Because it's uh, hey, spending a little bit of time on the freezing then spending quite a bit of time in getting the data and the facts, and then the blue people, the, those that were more rigorous, those can be very good there. 
Then another phase is, hey, let's uh, let's deliberate eh? because there is going to be a lot of issue about which are the most relevant criteria, which are the most relevant data, and the like. Eh? Then um, there has to be a phase that is okay. How, which are the potential solution to the issue that we are discussing? Well, again, uh, that's a difficult moment in, in, in that process. Then typically there is a, another a phase that we call it illumination. Eh? Illumination, we also place their yellow. Eh? Typically from creative people, once they have, they've been through the uh, previous phase steps, hey, someone come with a great idea. Someone sees that that can be solved in, in this way. Eh? This is number five. But then number six is, hey, that great idea. Not everyone buys it, eh? so you have to build consensus. Then the green people can be very useful for that because those are the integrators. And then last but not least, number seven is take the decision. And uh, then the red tend to be the, the ones that uh, would like to jump to this uh, faster. And then number eight, reinforce. Reinforce is probably going to all the who has to do it, when has to be done, how has to be done, these sort of things. So interesting, if we want to make good decisions in, in teams, uh, especially with complex issue, better to make a decision following the eight step or similar steps than just jumping into a decision without sort of going through the rigorness that is needed in the previous uh, phases. Finishing, so tool number six, uh, with uh, two messages is uh, don't spend more than 20% of your time in meetings. 20% I know is, is a whole day out of a week. Eh? More than that probably is dysfunctional. And again, there might be a lot of exceptions, eh? but take it as a rule. And then uh, match formats with contents. Eh? And uh, so let me go through this. There is four formats that we suggest. There is a format in which, uh, for different contents, a format is uh, the way we, we we see each other, the, the format of the meeting. There is a one format number one, let's call it number one, can be done daily or should be done daily. It's just five minutes standing up, <clears throat> standing together, just touching about, hey, what happened yesterday, what may happen today, so urgent issues. For the fact of sharing information, it's not the place to make any decision. No need for agenda, no need for minutes. And at the end, hey, the way, why we do it? So as to share information and also to create this sense of belonging. Format number two, weekly, we recommend it. Short, 50 minutes, 60. Just keep your eyes and following up projects so that uh, it's quick discussion, quick decisions, uh, not big issues, not big discussion, no agenda, no minutes. And uh, why we do it? Well, because we want this team to be on top of the month performance or the monthly performance. Okay? And this is the content and this is the reason of that particular format. Now here comes uh, the format number three. Monthly, long, two or three hours, strategic issues. The reason are to make strategic decisions. It has to be fact-based discussion. So that means that I don't discuss anything that is not well documented before. So that means that uh, don't jump into a discussion in which if uh, there is no, not a good documentation and in which there is not, so to speak, uh, pre-work in which most of the people had gone through that documentation and knows the issues. Okay? This format, uh, we need agenda and uh, some minutes on, on the decision that we've been taking. And basically the reason of that meeting is uh, pushing the short-term transformation of what we are doing. And then there is a format number four that uh, I just love it. It's just uh, easily quarterly or just month or just doing it two or three times a year at least. 
outside day and a half and the content disruptive features the long-term agenda and probably with a workshop so that uh, people have to work together and make presentations and then agree on on, 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 on the priorities that uh, we have chosen you you will have to use agenda and minutes for this type of uh, format and uh, the the reason of this format number four is long-term transformation so basically the message is don't bring into the same meeting issues that happen to be long-term transformation short-term transformation monthly performance or uh, just sharing uh, information because that's going to be a mess eh? and people are not going to be really are not going to be with focus enough so as to be really contributing if you end up messing too many things to in nature in the same meetings eh? so at least this is my experience so what else <clears throat> yes the last tool um there is a model that uh, we also use <clears throat> on assessing how strong is a team and uh, I, I want to share it with you and also there is uh, sort of another one or two tools uh, we use it also to categorize what sort of people do we end up having in our team eh? and uh, again those two two tools is with the purpose of uh, let's make let's bring people to that quadrant in which is high high eh? that quadrant in which uh, uh, the, the best of the people in a sort of uh, uh, people, uh, uh, following in, in that quadrant. This is Lencioni, who probably some of you may know, and he claims the following. A good team has to be based on trust and respect. We already know a, a team has to be also the foundation of a team is that the conflict has to be mostly functional. We already talk about this, but then he says that upon those two issues, then you can create a real commitment. Eh? And again, I'm not going to jump into this, but there is too much fake commitment around. Eh? And uh, so there is a lot of need to have uh, this uh, real commitment. And then on top of this real commitment, you can build accountability. Accountability is that people uh, own the results of their decision. And then last but, last but not least, a real uh, a solid team is a team in which the team priorities for every participant of that team, they put the team priorities ahead of their personal priorities. Then those are the five foundation of our team that they are working too well, uh, very well. So please check them and see if there is room for improvement in any of them. This is a little bit also another way through which uh, you can profile the people that you have around, how competent they are and how likable they are. Okay, low high, low high, and then eventually you have a start. And uh, let's uh, do things so that we get all of the people around here. If they are very competent and they are very likable, they know how to work together very well. Get rid of any incompetent jerk that you may have around. So no competent and not likable. And Tam, if you can, uh, the competent jerks. So people that are not very likable but they are very competent and. We may need them eh? uh, and also make sure that uh, those people that are very likable but still not very competent, let's bring it to the start. Eh? Uh, well, and uh, use this if you want, so because both uh, elements are uh, important to make a team work well, both uh, how competent the people end up being and how likable they are. And then also there is uh, this another way of profiling is how assertive happen to be the people that you have in your team and how much ego do they have okay? on control so I mean the bad part of it and or, or they have an ego that is relatively under control and typically if you mix those two variables what you get is someone that is confrontational when he or she is, has a big ego and is very assertive you typically have people that have big ego but are not very assertive those tend to be traitors uh, why? Because you don't know what they think, you don't know what they do, you don't know how, what they do with the information that they get from the team. So be aware that those are the most dangerous people around. You may have people that are not very assertive, but they are uh, sort of, uh, they have a personal ego on the control. Those are the givers. Uh, again, great to work with them, but careful because long-term a giver end up uh, 
can become someone a little bit frustrated. And then last but not least, you have the collaborative people. And those are the people that we need. People with uh, very assertive, but at the same time with a control, so to speak, uh, ego. Final remark, because it's time to finish. Well, one quotation of someone about this, that lives also <clears throat> close to the place in which <clears throat> some of you might, might be. <clears throat> he claims that most of the companies know how to scale technology, but still there is a lot of uh, room to how to scale the organization. Eh? Meaning by the organization, among many other things, teamwork. Eh? So make sure that also you contribute to that so that we can uh, take full advantage of uh, all the technology, of all the possibilities that we have been have around. And that's my last, so to speak, <clears throat> remark. Life, and uh, you know that probably better than myself, tend to be better if we stay committed to our decision, but also we stay flexible in the way we get things done. Eh? And uh, so let's uh, leave it there. And let's, if you want, open the floor for any question and answer that you may have. I do want to listen to you. I want to also to see what are the issues that you are confronting at, and if any of those tools may be uh, useful for you. So, hey, when you lead in teams, what has worked for you and what has not worked for you? Uh, what sort of uh, workplace model would you recommend? Those are the issues that I would love you to talk. To, 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 I, I would love myself to listen to you on, on those topics. So let me get rid of my presentation and let's just see each other a little bit more. So the floor open for so questions. Luis, thank you very much for the fascinating, fascinating presentation. Excellent. And I want to add that even if I didn't mention it, Luis is a very dear friend. So let's give him a, a virtual round of applause uh, because it was absolutely amazing. Before we start, um, we are going to proceed with the Q&A. Uh, but first, I'm going to, uh, to tell you a few comments. Uh, one is from Jose Maria Ibanez, uh, and it's an amazing slide, the one with the four meetings for, format. Explain in a very easy way some very powerful ideas. This will be my company's meeting agenda. Thank you. Then, and I apologize if I don't pronounce correct the names. <laughs> so, um, Gwanette Sinclair Marak, um, thank you kindly for this presentation. Would you be able to do this presentation to my master in business administration students? So, <laughs> You're yeah, invited. More than happy. Eh? More I than know uh, Mugersa. Uh, very interesting presentation, Luis. Thank you very much. And, uh, and then I have a few questions. Uh, we will start with uh, an anonymous. What are some tactics or recommendations for you to appropriately scale back meetings closer to the 20%? When someone works in a very meeting heavy department, for example, this function, expectation to attend to these meetings, etc. So typically, uh, they have to be, uh, you know, that the Japanese tend to use a technique that is the following is uh, start thinking on uh, how can, uh, what can I eliminate? Mm -hmm. So it's, uh, there might be some meetings in which I, uh, I don't need to be there. Eh? Second, second step is how can I simplify the things that I do have to be part of? So another way is how can we simplify some of them? And then the third uh, step that they use is uh, let's combine uh, two things in one. Eh? So go through this, uh, what to eliminate, what to simplify and what to combine. And eventually you may get, so, so to speak, a little bit more, uh, so, uh, less time for meetings. Eh? Uh, again, be flexible because 20% is, is sort of a, is, 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 is a good benchmark. There might be occasion in which you have to go through a little bit more, but too many meetings is, is unhealthy. Uh, and also too few meetings is also unhealthy because me meetings are great, has to be great coordination tools. Uh, in that sense, they have to be well managed. They have to be well uh, facilitated. 
They have to be, and they go, the goal is the following. Everyone at the end of a meeting has to say, hey, I, I finished this meeting better in terms of knowledge, in terms of empathy, in terms of <clears throat> focus than I started that same meeting. Yeah, that has to be the goal. Next, next question from Mehmet Messi. <coughs> How do you make good hiring decisions? What type, of, what type of personal characteristics you look for in addition of competence? Do you prefer a star player versus a nice guy? Well, basically, uh, likability is going to become more important. Why? Because uh, problems are going to be more complex and because uh, problems are going to be more complex, we need more diverse team. And part of making a diverse team work well is that we need people that know how to integrate. Mm -hmm. Integration, the skill of uh, becoming an integrator, uh, human integrator, eh? not software integrator, is going to become more and more important. Eh? Uh, and in that sense, likability or being nice is part, of, is, is part of that. Nice is also an attitude, eh? an attitude that is uh, of, um, uh, that I am, uh, an attitude that uh, you, you, you tend to be willing to share uh, you, I don't know, has to be a little bit with what we call this in, uh, this intelligent heart. Uh, heart means that your feelings towards most of the people tend to be positive, but uh, you tend to be predisposed to to to, to start you, that reciprocity yourself. Okay? So you're becoming more generous and becoming someone that uh, part of uh, if you happen to be in a team, part of your task that you self enforce to yourself is how how. How can you contribute to the knowledge development of everyone here? Okay. Uh, talent is not just knowledge and competence. Talent is also attitudes. Okay. And uh, being nice or being likable is, is part of this, is part of your talent. Excellent. So uh, there is an anonymous. Uh, how are apps for a synchronic work like Slack or Trello helping or not for the integration and performance challenges in a team? It's going to become more difficult uh, because uh, there is going to be more fragmentation. Knowledge is going to be more fragmented. Uh, lifestyle is more fragmented. Uh, countries tend to be more fragmented. Uh, ideologies tend to be more fragmented. So we have here a uh, the uh, fragmentation equal to more complex and complex mm, can become dysfunctional. Okay? So this is why I keep 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 emphasizing that uh, we have to develop those uh, integration skills uh, because if not, uh, it's going to become more harder uh, to make good decisions and to execute them. And uh, it's, it's a pity because then we will not capitalize all the opportunities that uh, we are going to have right now. Laura is treachered. When working with trans transdisciplinary teams, how do you build a common language? Well, you have to build to start with a common purpose. Okay? Uh, so that's part of it. Maybe another way through which uh, you can uh, also is build these common norms on, on how we want to work together. So in one hand, you have the long-term purpose or long-term views on what it, this is all about. And at the same time, we have sort of uh, some rules on how we want to work together well. Okay? I do have, and I can send it to you, Angeles, uh, an article that I just published a month ago on how to uh, how to lead a remote teams, okay? in which uh, there is a lot of, so to speak, uh, minor issues on how to solve issues that has to do with uh, uh, not only language, <clears throat> but also um, a, different uh, time zones and uh, different so to speak, personality and the like. So there is an article <coughs> in which <coughs> I describe some solution of those minor issues that are end up creating difficulties in, 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 in working well together for uh, teams that are very diverse. Yeah, we can add it uh, with the email that we will send with the, with the recording uh, webinar. Next question, how do you recommend to assess the staff when there isn't a perfect system in place for remote work. Yes, so, okay. 
you have to develop a, a, a feeling eh? and uh, one way through which uh, there, there are some of those tools that I share with you that eventually can help you. You know that uh, these colors are based on people because people that are more rational, these are these people that tend to be more emotional and uh, you can identify that by how they work, how, what sort of words, words do they use, their language. Uh, this, the colors are also based on people that tend to be a little bit more reflective, vis-a-vis -vis people that are more uh, extrovert. And again, that's something that you can easily uh, get what, who is in front of you. Uh, but basically the message, the message is that uh, coffee for all doesn't work. Okay? And uh, part of your job is that you have to personalize the way you lead that person. Typically, I haven't shared with you, but we use this another two metric metrics in which is how how much uh, how much is this person um, um, aligned with the with the long term goals of the team and how high is the alignment of that person in the way we work together. So it's more on the execution, and then you end up having four different situations in which low low. Your leadership has to be tough, giving instructions, doing follow-up, uh, so, so that through that you can help that person. And then typically someone that uh, is very aligned with the long-term strategy and is very aligned with the way we do things, that's that's a person in which you have to delegate even more. And you have, so to speak, to keep so supporting him or her so that uh, he or she can keep growing as, as a professor. Anonymous, uh, what are the world challenges months and years after COVID-19, respectively? We'll see. Eh? Uh, we'll see. We still happen to be uh, vaccines uh, are still most of the countries, just 10, 50 percent of the population. By June, July, hopefully we are going to get that in a little bit more time. I think that uh, there is going to be, uh, as uh, we said before, uh, more hybrid models. Uh, there is going to be uh, more people deciding that working for them at home is good. There are some other companies in which they may have experienced that working remotely doesn't help to create that good teamwork and this culture. So we'll see. I think that uh, we are going to have uh, companies like Liberty said that, that everyone is going to work from home. Offices are going to be only support centers eh, so that uh, they are, you may have to go to pick up things and uh, to have some meeting from time to time. Or we may have companies like uh, BlackRock, as I mentioned before, in which uh, there is going to be a, a strong emphasis that 85% uh, of the people have to work back to the office. Eh? I don't know. My, 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 my feeling is that uh, remote working and remote teaching is going to stay okay? and uh, it's going to be complemented with offsites and with uh, probably better sort of the time together. Uh, I still, uh, my experience is when working with top executive with uh, putting them together in a room. Uh, you create this collective intelligence much easier than just through. And life is three dimension. A computer is a two dimension. And typically, with three dimension, we have much more information than with two dimension. Next question. I'm not so sure if Amri Singh uh, finished uh, typing the question. So mm -hmm. you mentioned the best employee is assertive, but not so much as to be egocentric and to catch into the direction. And I was like, did something. So I do not know exactly, Amrit, if you want to finish your question, I'm sure that Professor Wete will be delighted to answer. There is an anonymous uh, that I say, how near uh, or far are business leaders of the purpose economy? Hey, that's also one of the interesting waves uh, that we are seeing around. Is, uh, and it's very much based on, uh, let's see if we can have more leadership around common good. Eh? 
And common good is uh, making the ecosystem work better. And the um, uh, 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 ecosystem gets better if you improve as a professional and as a person, if uh, someone that is close to you also improve. So because they happen to be part of the ecosystem. And also the common good is that uh, we end up developing better relationship among ourselves. Okay? Purpose may help okay? because uh, typically values end up United, uniting people, uh, while uh, ideologies tend to divide people. So if we emphasize uh, purpose based on values, uh, values related with the common good, I think that can be a great source of integration. And that also can become a great, so to speak, uh, school of values, so to speak. Eh? Companies or uh, institutions uh, can have are a formidable <clears throat> to, to create social mobility based on talent. And we need institutions that uh, whomever has the talent uh, has a bright future. Mm -hmm. uh, if we create societies in which uh, talent is not well recognized and is not well, so to speak, supported, it's a pity because uh, those people that can do so much for the common good uh, may not have the opportunity to do it. So yes, purpose is, 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 I hope is going to become a more and more important. And purpose hopefully is going to drive more this leadership based on common good. Esther Jimeno uh, has another question. Some of the descriptions of team members you have used can be applied to people going through different situations. For example, somebody going through a divorce could be a jerk just because he or she is stressed out. How do you get to tell profiles from situational attitudes? Yeah. Very interesting. Yeah, you know that stress and up creating, uh, and uh, Angeles, you know that better than myself, it creates a hormone that is called uh, cortisol that uh, end up having three, at least three uh, effects that are horrible. No? One is that uh, end up creating a very, so to speak, uh, tunnel vision on, on things, uh, and meaning that you don't see the whole thing. You only see the source of uh, your uh, issues. Uh, cortisol also make people be more aggressive. Okay? And in that sense, they make people become more like a jerk, uh, as you said. And the third thing is that uh, 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 cortisol, so stress, uh, end up becoming also, uh, end up creating, uh, accelerate the, uh, the aging of the cells of the body. Okay? So mm, we have to learn how to cope with a difficult situation, with complexity, with uh, stress, eh? because if we keep sort of uh, uh, creating cortisol in our, in, in our body, well, that's going to kill us. It's going to make us on one hand uh, jerks, uh, and in the second hand, it's also going to accelerate on the aging process. Excellent. So there is an anonymous here that I think is a continuation with some of the question. I say, I understand that correctly. If so, I believe you can't change a person's personality. For, is, for instance, some people are not comfortable being assertive. Of course. Yeah. Well, basically, um, can you change your personality? Typically, we say that yes, but takes time uh, and uh, basically takes four things. Uh, you have to be very, you have to be willing to do it. Uh, many times you don't want to do it. Second is that uh, maybe you need someone to help you around. So that, uh, the fact that I feel that this is a process in which I have some assistance uh, tend to help to get results. Third, you need a little bit of methodology and then you need discipline because it's going to take some time. Okay? So this is why it's so difficult to change, eh? because you need at least four ingredients, eh? methodology, discipline, a companion, and also you need a sort of a willingness to, 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 to do it. One way through which I've seen people that uh, they can change is through their uh, time allocation. Eh? So if you uh, spend more time on issues that are related with uh, being Assertive, assertive in the good sense. There is a bad assertiveness, a good assertiveness. The good assertiveness, as you know, is that, uh, hey, you use your influence, uh, you, you do the follow-up, uh, you sort of uh, feel very strong on issues, and uh, so you know how to negotiate that. 
And I think that those are very positive things eh? that can come with different personality. So assertiveness is not just being a jerk always. Eh? It's many times it's been someone that knows how to get things done because you're persuasive, you're influential, you know how to negotiate, you know how to sort of be nice with people so that they are or they trust you, these sort of things. Excellent. Another anonymous, biggest challenge tech companies are having issues with remote teams, not able to develop new research products without in-person interaction. The other challenge of uh, WFH is that the disruption of the personal lives of young people is impacting their outputs. Yeah. I agree with both things, and I've seen that, that this is why remote work is not going to last forever. It's not going to be for everyone. And uh, this is why there might be reasons, uh, the two of them that you mentioned, that is a call for uh, go back to work on the premises. and. Uh, and, uh, and I think it's also wonderful. They might be at the cost in terms of um, traveling and in cost of, in terms of, uh, hey, but at the same time, uh, for many of us, it's a joy to be with others and it's a joy so to speak, to be together in, us, uh, in, in the same premise for at least a, a relatively high proportion of time. Okay? We'll see. Eh? I think that also tend to be related with uh, personalities. The beauty of remote work is that the talent, no matter that you happen to be in Bangladesh, no, happen, no matter that you happen to be, I don't know, in, in, in South Africa, is that uh, you can work for the best uh, organization and the best uh, companies of the world, no matter where they are. Eh? And I think that in that sense, we have to create a little bit more a, a effort in, in making remote work, work work well, because that's another way through which we can uh, create this social mobility that I was mentioning before. And I should agree that uh, just because we are using remote, you can be in Madrid and we can be here in California. Yes, so I'm, I'm well, so happy that we can I enjoy that. To be not in Madrid, in Cadiz. Eh? So, ah, yeah. you're in Cadiz, even better. Beautiful <laughs> place in front of the beach. Uh, and before I was uh, with you, I was playing golf with my son. So perfect. <laughs> Enjoying, uh, so to speak, this combination of uh, professional life and personal life. Wonderful. Now we have another question from Lorenzo Rodriguez Durantes. Hi, Lorenzo. Lorenzo. We love Lorenzo. Uh, the question is, could you make a quick comparative summary of how international and national organizations do they, be, do they behave in relationship with the good practices of organi organizational behave, behavior? He wants to know what you recommend. Oh, interesting. I think the, the split is not so much into national or international organization. I think that the, the the best practices and the not so good practices has to do more with the culture of the, of the company. And again, culture at the end happen to be behaviors as uh, we know very well. And behaviors tend to be related with the context that uh, we have created. Okay? So what I've seen is that um, there are national and international companies that tend to focus very much on issues like control, like contract, like uh, compliance, uh, like uh, these sort of things are in which uh, that context oof, doesn't create the best, doesn't help us to, to, to develop our best version. And there might be also companies, and I've seen that there are large companies and small companies, international or national, in which the stress is not so much on those things that I said before, but the stress tend to be more on trust, uh, on, um, on support, on um, discipline, self-discipline, on uh, stretching, and uh, that context well, creates a much more proactive uh, behaviors, end up creating more commitment and the like. Okay? So it has to do more with the character of the people at the top and with the culture that they end up creating. Neus Tarres, she said, yeah. by the way, it's, all, it's being a pressure as always, and the question is, percentage-wise, from your experience, how many companies might really be applying this type of management style? Not very many. Eh? Eh, 
my experiences that uh, this content tend to be relatively, it's common sense in one hand, so at the end it's not very sophisticated. But at the same time, for most of the company that uh, I end up explaining, for many of them, not for all of them, tend to be, so to speak, new stuff or new material okay, or new thinking. Okay? So I will say that uh, people that uh, use those line of ideas um, tend to be 20% and then uh, companies that tend not to be so much aligned on the philosophy that is behind of the ideas that they share with you tend to be more than 70-80%. Yeah, that's my wild guess. And, and I think probably the last one, uh, an anonymous, what do you think of including some family members in 360 competence, competencies assessments? Do leaders manage work and family simultaneously and this alters wellness and performance? Okay, that's another big issue. Eh? It's, it's, uh, most of the company happen to be family owned. Eh? And uh, it's uh, also for many of us that can be a great so social mobility to create a company that is owned by, 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 by you and then by your family. Um, and then there are many, many very interesting issues on governance, eh? on, on family owned business. Eh? Uh, let me say that part of uh, running well uh, a family-owned company is creating what is called a, a, a is creating a, a business uh, is creating a family an entrepreneurial family. Meaning by this, uh, creating a condition in which uh, your uh, family, your son and daughters, uh, knows about business, they, they like it, they at least are able to become uh, responsible shareholders whenever uh, many of them or some of them may not work in the company, but uh, they know how to act on the govern, governance uh, uh, bodies in which they might end up working. And uh, that, create, that creating that good feeling about business and about your particular company in, in your family is, is has to be a priority. Okay? What I've seen in some families is that uh, uh, their entrepreneurs, the founders end up coming home very stressed with uh, becoming a little bit jerk okay? and then probably not being very nice with their uh, kids and uh, then and the kids uh, saying, hey, I don't want to be like my father okay? or like my mother. So this, so to speak, rejected okay? that possibility of uh, or yes uh, uh, having a, a reaction in which they don't want to be part of, of that business no matter that they will have to inherit yeah. so yes uh, we need to create the condition in our uh, second generation or third generation in which uh, uh, they have feedback on how they are they have the opportunity to improve and they have to we have to create a very self-demanding, so to speak, environment so that they also end up being very competent and also being very exemplary to the rest of the people that are part of the management but are not part of the family. So I think we can finalize here. Uh, thank you very much, Professor Wete, for your time and absolutely excellent presentation. Mm -hmm. I also want to thank the San Diego chapter of the Fulbright Association and the University of California San Diego Global Education Program, especially to Debbie Gianni for making this webinar possible. And finally, thank you to you all for attending the webinar. We will send you a link with the recording and let you know about next Fulbright speaker series. So be safe, wear a mask, and thank you for joining us. Adios. Adios. Bye-bye.